Institute at um, Los Angeles NHM. Her research focuses primarily on avian um, evolution and the use of phylogenetics to study Cretaceous bird diversity. She's been participating in uh, Natural History um, Museum LA DIG since 2005 and has worked throughout the Western United States on such specimens as Thomas the T-Rex <coughs> and Natalie. Um, she also is the lead paleontologist for SWCA Environmental Consultants. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Rosetta. Thank you very much. All right, uh, thank you for the introduction. Um, I'm excited to be here today to talk to you guys about these birds. Um, they're pretty exciting. Uh, I did my PhD dissertation work on these birds and continue work on them uh, today. Um, so I just want to get a really quick show of hands. Who here has ever heard of Hesperornis before? Okay, some of you, cool. Um, how about Bathornis? A few, a few less. Parahesperornis? Okay, so, so we're getting, getting a baseline there, all right. So, Hesperonis is a fairly fairly well-known um, Mesozoic bird, but what people might not realize is that there are actually dozens mm -hmm. of species of related birds, all of which falling into the Hesperoniform. And so I work on this entire group, and one of the things I'd like to do today is sort of introduce you to that diversity. Um, here's a basic overview of, of what I'll be talking about today. So first we'll just go through the fossil record and the relationship of these birds, um, and then really brief window into some of the things I'm working on right now um, with my research. Um, so there's some, some pretty weird birds that we're going to meet. So when we talk about the fossil records, um, these birds have been known for a very long time. So the first specimens were discovered in the 1870s on the expedition, the very famous expeditions that O.C. Marsh led uh, into Kansas um, and that part of the central United States. So in 1872, Marsh published the first sort of official announcement naming Hesperonis regulus um, from specimens that were found in the Smoky Hill Chalk, which is 82 <coughs> to 87 million years old, roughly. Um, and then this is a picture of his uh, field expedition from that year. Kind of at the same time, but on the other, the other side of the world, um, Harry Seeley was working on uh, a bunch of bird material that was coming out of the Cambridge green sand. Um, and so all of this material, this is some of his uh, illustrations from the original publication in 1876 is highly fragmentary. So these aren't pretty fossils the way that we sometimes get to find them. Um, they're pretty bashed up. But they're still really interesting. Uh, he named the collection to the genus Analiornis and then recognized two different species, Sedgwicki and Ferretti. Um, and those are quite a bit older than the material uh, that Marsh was working on. So those are 95 to 100 million years old. <coughs> So by the end of the 1800s, Marsh had continued his work uh, in the American West or Midwest, um, and so he had recognized a number of different types of Hesperoniformes, um, all from that same Smoky Hill Chalk, and then uh, Seeley's work over in England. However, for as near as we can tell, Marsh and Seeley weren't in communication with each other and were not aware of each other's work. So an Aliornis was not recognized as a Hesperoniform um, until much, much later. Um, so while there were a number of the modern genera described by this point, nobody had really looked at them all together. Today, we've expanded this record quite a bit. <coughs> so today, there are 30 species that have been named, whether or not those are all valid species is something we'll get into in a little bit, um, in 11 different genera. And as you can see, they have a near global distribution in the northern hemisphere. Uh, there are none known from the southern hemisphere. There have been whispers about a specimen somewhere in Australia that I can't actually track down, <laughs> so who knows if that exists or not. Um, but again, most of them are from sort of the, the Western Interior Seaway deposits um, and then some others scattered throughout uh, Europe and Asia. And then here's a really rough sort of size estimate to give you an idea of the range. So these are scaled roughly to the size of this skeleton here. Um, and so you can see there are some very large individuals. The largest would be uh, Hesperonis rossicus uh, from Sweden. And then there are also some very small individuals, um, like Judy Nornis here, and then Pasquia Ornis uh, from Saskatchewan. In terms of their temporal distribution, they're entirely uh, late Cretaceous. So Analiornis and Pasquia Ornis would be the two oldest 
um, of the genera and then going all the way up to into the Maastrichtian for some of these other Hesperna forms. So they were around for a very long time. When we think about fossil birds, a lot of times in the media or with what we're familiar with, we tend to think of these sorts of specimens. So we have Archaeopteryx here, obviously the very famous one, and then all of these um, beautiful, beautifully well-preserved birds, um, largely complete. Uh, we'll have dozens of specimens per species sometimes, more than that. Um, common soft tissue preservation, so uh, feathers, very common, uh, skin impressions, sometimes even <coughs> internal organs. Um, and they are flattened, so this is entirely two-dimensional preservation. Um, you couldn't necessarily extract them from the rock and mount them the way that we do something like a Tyrannosaur if they just fall apart. Um, this is very different from the fossil record that I work with of Hesperidiforms. They're not as pretty. <laughs> They're not nearly as exciting in, those, in that regard. Um, so this is the holotype of Babcornus of Venus. This is the very uh, end of a foot bone, so it's the partial metaphorsis of a bird. Um, and then this is that uh, analiornis material. So there are some that are more complete, but this is, this is more general uh, what you're going to find. So incomplete specimens, very rare. Dr. tissue preservation. In fact, we'll look at the one example that we do have of that. Um, however, and this is, this is the benefit that these birds give, is that they have three-dimensional preservation. These bones are not <coughs> flat. All right, they have not been compressed by time the way that something like Archaeopteryx has been. Um, so that gives us some interesting opportunities in terms of figuring out the ecology um, and more things about the reconstruction of these birds. So if we want to look at that sort of fragmentary record overall, um, this is a graph documenting the number of specimens um, of each of the different species that have been described. Um, and so the black are specimens that contain under three elements. So fewer, three or fewer bones for that individual. Um, and then the red ones um, are specimens that consist of three or more elements. So as you can see, there's not a lot of red down here. Um, but the specimens that are in the red, the ones that do have multiple elements preserved, are the ones that can tell us the most about who these birds were. Here's a breakdown of how which bones tend to get preserved, and as you can see, it's it, almost entirely hind limb. All right, so most of these birds are known only from hind limb bones. Um, axial skeleton, that would be pelvis and vertebra. Forelimb is fairly rare. Skull is very rare. And so here's an example um, of those hind limb bones that we're talking about. So the majority of the fossil record of these birds consists of these three bones. <laughs> the femur, the tibia tarsus, and the tarsus metatarsus, or the foot bone, the shin bone, and then the, the thigh bone here in general terms. So in terms of systematics and how all of these different taxa are related to each other, um, this is what the bulk of my early research in these birds, my, my dissertation focused on, was starting to sort out these relationships. Um, and so this is, what, this is what had been sort of agreed upon before I started working on these birds. Um, in terms of these main families, um, an odd guy here, Potomornis, very incomplete, um, and then the genera that were assigned to each family and then the species within each genus. Um, and so my, my first question was to try to figure out how they were related to each other and see if I could confirm that these were accurate sorts of divisions. This is the evolutionary work that had been done, so that's not much. Um, back in the 80s, uh, some work concluded that they, they belonged in the middle of a group with um, loons, grebes, and penguins. Uh, this is clearly not correct. Um, and then uh, a little bit later work uh, recognized that they were a distinct lineage of fossil birds, of Mesozoic birds, um, and put them in this sort of rough order. So my first goal was to, to update this and to create something that was a little more scientifically rigorous. Um, so the first step, this is a paper that uh, Jingmei and Luis and I published um, back in 2011, was to look at Hesperidiforms within the context of other Mesozoic birds. So the rest of this tree has been updated since 2011, obviously, but I'm just going to focus on down here. If we zoom in at this uh, clade that contains the Hesperidiforms, um, we see that they, they fall out very similar uh, to Martin's original sort of hypothesis about their relationships. And so this was my first step. And then my next step was to add in 
many of these other taxa that had not been considered before, um, which would be everything in green here. So these were the birds that I was able to actually include in my analysis. Um, these are scattered all over the world in different museums. So I was fortunate enough to get to go to most of those museums and see um, these individuals. Some of the ones I didn't get to were the ones that are in Mongolia, um, and then this one up in Canada somewhere. And so here are the results of that analysis. Um, the interesting thing here was to recognize that there really is very little distinction uh, between the different species of Hesperornis and some of these other specimens that have been identified as potentially being unique. Um, that highlights that maybe we don't have as many species as we think. Maybe it would be better served to consolidate these into a single um, species, which is one of the things that I'm still working on. Um, Another interesting thing that came out of this that we'll talk about later is this guy right here. So this is the specimen number um, that was designated as the holotype of Fumacolis. And so we'll look at him in a little bit more detail. So going back to this list of the, the, the specimen or the species that I started with, um, one of the main takeaways was that Pasquiorna should not be considered as part of the bad Pornipidae. If we look back on the tree here, uh, Pasquiorna is actually the most primitive. So it is the most basal of the Hesperniforms. It's clearly not lumped in here with the rest of Baptornis. And then there are a number of other taxa that prove to be problematic or, or in need of further work um, here by these, by these question marks. So those are sort of the directions that I'm still working on. So we can simplify that tree. Um, into the sort of the, the, the key groups of Hesperniforms, um, mostly by genus. Um, and so let's go through these a little bit now so you can get a better idea of this diversity and look at some of the features that make them uh, interesting and unique. So their ecology is one of the main things that is interesting <coughs> about them. So these are the first truly aquatic, uh, fully aquatic dinosaurs. Um, these are the first time that dinosaurs took over that entirely distinct ecosystem of the marine um, or the estuarine <coughs> realm. Um, and in that regard, it can tell us a lot about evolution. Um, for birds to evolve to fly in the time of Archaeopteryx and to then immediately backpedal and lose that um, in the Hesperniforms by the time you get to the late Cretaceous uh, is a pretty amazing evolutionary transition. Um, and so the role that ecology plays in providing those selective pressures is something that I'm interested in looking at with these birds. So Marsh's original reconstruction, you guys may have seen this picture before, it's very famous, um, had these guys standing up. Um, it's questionable whether they even could stand up. I don't know if you guys are modern birders at all, but if you have ever tried to watch grebes mm -hmm. walk around on land, they're, they're the most sadly awkward birds on land you've ever seen. Like they, they, don't, they can't stand up effectively. Um, and Hesperniforms in the hip region were even more derived were even more specialized than something like a loon or a grebe. Um, and so it's questionable that this is even possible. Um, this is a more accurate sort of modern reconstruction. Um, and then this is our, our local paleo artist, uh, Stephanie Abramowicz, uh, created this image uh, for me as the, the fleshed out version. So why do we think they were foot propelled divers? What are some of the features about them uh, that really jump out at us and, and highlight the very specialized lifestyle that these birds shared. The first is that they, they weren't flying at all. Um, so this is a zoom in on the, the forelimb region, color coded here with different elements. And you can see that compared to the size of this bird, this is an absurdly tiny one. It was not flying anymore. Um, so sad to say, they were restricted to um, terrestrial or aquatic environments. Um, if we look at hind limb adaptations, um, colors there, but, um, so we can see that there are a number of features of this region of the body, from the pelvis all the way down the hind limb into the toes, uh, that are unique among dive birds that we only find among foot-propelled diving birds in particular. Um, remember, with their, their wings are reduced, their wings would not have been effective as flippers either. Um, they're, that, they're that small. And if we look at modern foot-propelled divers, we get an idea of the key similarities that all of these birds share skeletally, and we can also find those same adaptations in Hesperniforms to varying degrees. 
the fact that it is to varying degrees is interesting because it tells us that not all Hesperanthiforms were equally adapted to this realm. We find some that are more primitive, that are not as specialized as some of the others. And here is a list of some of these features that they all share. Um, we'll look at some of these in a little bit more detail. Um, but they're all aimed at maximizing power production by the hind limbs when moving through water. And if you think about trying to swim through water, it's a very different medium than trying to fly through the air. So the things that make you a more effective flyer would make you a less effective diver. And so what we're looking at is how Hesperdithiforms gained these traits in the process losing the features that made them their ancestors flying birds. So the first really obvious thing among diving, foot propelled divers is the pelvis. Um, so this is a chicken pelvis, just for comparison. Um, and you can see that all of these divers have incredibly elongate, very linear uh, pelvis here. Um, it streamlines their body, basically. So they have less resistance as they're swimming through the water. Um, if you think about something vertically oriented like a chicken trying to swim through the water, it's not gonna be very good at it. If you have something torpedo shaped, which is essentially what these birds have become, uh, much better for swimming through the water. <laughs> the femurs, uh, the thigh bone, is another way that these birds have changed quite a bit. So um, this is uh, the femur of a guinea fowl, and you can see it's fairly elongate, it's thin. Um, it's slightly curved, but not much. And if you look at Parahesporinus, which is um, a type of Hesperinus form, um, and then a grebe here, you can see that these two have much more robust femurs. So their femur is a very solid, very strong bone. Um, and then you can also see that there's a bit more curvature um, along the shaft of the femur than in the guinea fowl. So this is something else that we see uh, commonly in all foot propelled divers. Um, the robustness of the bone is important when you think about the way muscles function. So muscle attaches to the bone and es essentially uses the bone as leverage, tightens against the bone to create power. Um, the larger the area of attachment, in general, the stronger the muscle can be. So anytime you see a really robust area of muscle attachment, like all of these sort of ridges and lumps here on this parahesporinus bone, that's telling you that's a very strong point of muscle attachment. If you look at the, the guinea fowl in comparison, it's much smoother. Um, even on the grief here, you can see much more robust muscle attachment. So these guys were doing way more with their legs than terrestrial or uh, regular flying birds do. This, this idea of muscle attachment continues as we look at the rest of the leg. Um, so these are the, the tibia tarsi of different birds. Um, so this is the shin bone, right, the, lo the lower leg bone. So this is the chicken, um, para has pornus and a grebe. The thing that, that jumps out at you is this weird projection here off the top, just like this arrow that's pointing up in the air. Um, it's almost absent on the chicken. This is entirely unique to foot propelled divers. It's where the muscles that rotate the toes attach. So if you think about the, the muscles that move your toes, those attach all the way up around the knee joint. Um, and this huge expansion indicates how strong their feet were for primarily powering them through the water. So if we put these together, we can sort of compare uh, many, many other details across the hind limb that these guys share. Um, the tarsum metatarsus, the foot bone, is an interesting shape. You can see these the trochlea down here, these little lumps at the end, where the, where the bone ends, that's where each of the toes attach, so one, two, and three. Um, three toes attaching there. Uh, the way that they're stacked enables the birds to stack their toes together when they pull their feet back in, so that cuts down on water resistance. Um, and so this is the kind of thing that um, I spent a lot of time working on at the beginning of my dissertation, was just trying to pin down all of these specific features um, that highlight the differences between diving birds, foot propelled divers in particular, um, and other sort of like regular flying birds. So as we come back to this phylogeny, if we map some of these traits onto the phylogeny, what we see are that as Hesperinthiforms became more derived, all the way down to Hesperinus, um, they became better and better divers. So Pasteornis, which we'll look at in a little bit more detail in a second, um, wasn't very specialized. Um, it didn't, it had the nemial expansion, they all have that. Um, but there are a lot of other features, um, like the reduction of the humerus, 
the expansion of the muscle attachments here on the femur, uh, the orientation of the toes, all of those features came later in Hesperniformis evolution. Paschiornis and Naliornis didn't share those, right? So they, they were not as well adapted to diving as some of these later guys. So if we go back to our simplified uh, phylogeny, we can start with Paschiornis. Um, there's two species that have been recognized. They're defined solely based on size. One is the smaller and the other is the larger. Um, they're from the Belfouche Formation, which is about the same age as an Aliornis. Uh, so they're some of the, the older Hesperiforms from Canada. Um, all of the specimens are isolated. We don't have any two, even, that we could say go together and belong to a single individual. So they're all just scattered bones. Um, the interesting thing about Paschiornis is that it has the least reduced forelimb or wing of any of the Hesperiforms. So if a Hesperiform could fly, and that's a big if, it would have been this one. The rest of them, not at all. But this one, in, in terms of, so this is the, the discipline of the humerus, we see more development. It looks a little bit more like a flighted bird humerus. Um, not entirely the same. It is not as well developed for sure. If it could fly, it wasn't a very good flyer. Um, but in terms of being the most basal, the, the least derived of the Hesperiniforms, Paschiornis fits that bill. Um, and Naliornis is another one of the more primitive ones. Um, again, all isolated specimens. So this, there's not a whole lot we can we can really say about an Um in terms of the whole body. We just have bones here and there. Um, like I said earlier, from the Cambridge Green Sand in England, recognized three species today. Um, so in the 90s, a third species was erected out of the same material that Seeley had originally worked on and named after him. Um, and again, they're all defined by size. Um, there aren't any really specific features of the bones that differ in the collection of fossil material. Um, and so here's an example of some of the specimens. Again, this is Seeley's original work. Um, not, specimens have not been added to the Analiornis record since Seeley looked at the original excavations uh, back in the late 1800s. Um, we're not finding more of these, uh, which is interesting. I'm not entirely sure why that would be, but we appear to have found them all. Um, and so it's, it's a little problematic to take these, this collection of this type of material, I mean, this is very poorly preserved, there's really not much to say about it, um, and decide that all of the elements, and there's probably a hundred or so specimens overall of an Aliorna, belong to one of three species. Who's to say that this Tarsometatarsus and this Tibiotarsus belong to the same species? We have no way of, of comparing, it's sort of like apples and oranges. So that's one of the things that makes an Aliorna a problematic taxa uh, to work on. So we're going to skip down to the broad avidae. This is one of the most recent um, sort of groups of Hesperniforms that was uh, defined. Um, there are four species that are recognized, um, and they have uh, quite the distribution. So most of them are from um, the interior of the United States, but there is one uh, specimen known from Mongolia. And these are some of the um, youngest. Uh, has the form. So they, they back all the way up to the uh, uh, KT boundary. Um, and they have a huge range in body sizes. So this is Varnary, the biggest one from uh, South Dakota. And then uh, Mongoliensis and uh, Americanus are both very small individuals. So big range there. Again, a highly incomplete um, collection of material. So this is all there is of these three species. <laughs> Just a foot bone, and not even a complete one of that. Um, and then this is the uh, broad even Varnary. So Varnary is better preserved. So it's probably 20% complete, which for a Hesperniforme is quite good. Um, so this guy, we do have lots of other bones. Um, there's some pelvis material, there's some vertebra, uh, some more of the hind limb. So this guy can tell us a lot. Hey, this guy's not so much. But one of the interesting things that we do see, even in just this you know, very small amount of material, um, is this interesting curvature to the second metatarsal here. Um, you don't see this in any other group of Hesperniforms. Um, that's why these individuals, these four species, were lumped together into broad avis as a genus and a family. Um, I haven't, again, I haven't seen these two, so these are the sketches from the publication. Um, Fumicolis is another one of the newer ones. Um, so Fumicolis uh, is a specimen er, that Luis and I worked on and described 
um, as an original genus and species. Um, it was originally identified as bats hornets. So it was collected in the 1960s and it's been sitting in the museum, um, but it had just been assumed to be bats hornets on the basis of size, primarily. Um, but when I started looking at it, um, I realized that it was actually very different from bats hornets in some interesting ways. Um, so one of the more interesting things about how it differs is that it's kind of an intermediate between bats hornets and Hesperonis, like Hesperonis or Parahesperonis. So Hesperonis is a, the most derived of, of these birds, so it's very, very easily um, recognized as an excellent typical diving bird. Uh, Baptornis is more primitive, so it's, Baptornis doesn't have as many of those features that we talked about that point to it being a good diver. And Fumicolis is right in the middle between them. So in terms of watching this evolutionary transition of becoming better and better adapted to a diving lifestyle, Fumicolis has a lot to tell us about the order in which that happened. Um, and so this figure just runs down some of the details, um, the things that, that we're looking at. Again, this is, it gets a little technical with the language, so I'm not going to stick to the names too much, but you know, the, the development of the outside of the foot bone here, like this width, that's something that you see uh, in the more advanced divers. Uh, again, the stacking of the toes here, um, the, the space of this hole in between the end of the, of the tarsometer so lots of little features are the kinds of things that we look for to figure out how derived is this individual. And in Parahesperonis, this, this one's one of my favorites, um, there's only one species. Um, it's only known from two specimens, but they are among the most complete of Hesperonis specimens that we know of. So they're two of the only ones that we could look at and actually say, no, we pretty much know what this bird looks like in terms of all of the elements. So this is one of the, one of the specimens, um, parts of it. So it's primarily preserved in two slabs. There's another smaller slab that I didn't show a picture of that has the, the sternum preserved. Um, and then there's some isolated vertebrae and things that are kind of floating around. Um, but so you see the, the spinal column is articulated which is really important. Um, if you have a bunch of disarticulated vertebrae, it can be very difficult to figure out what order they're supposed to go in. Um, the pelvis is nearly complete. Uh, and then here we have the rest of the pelvis in the second slab. Uh, and then there's the patella, the femur, um, the tibia tarsus, and then the pygostyle, so the very end of the tail over here. Um, this guy is just missing the feet and the skull. And then we have the other specimen that is even more complete and includes the skull. Parasaurus had a much broader skull. 
undistorted. Um, it's probably one of the only completely undistorted Mesozoic bird skulls I've ever seen. Um, shame it's just the back end, but it's still interesting. And then finally, Hesperornis, the big one, the famous one, the sexy one that everybody knows about. Um, nine species have been described, um, or are currently recognized, um, and they, they come from of the entire genus. Um, most of these are incomplete. So Mengele, Verity, Gracilis here, this is it. This is their fossil record, these three bones. <laughs> so again, not a lot we can say about them. Um, Chowie has a few bones known for it. Um, Rossicus, this is it. Um, so yeah, Hesperornis regulus is the one that is the best known. Um, there are a few other species that I haven't shown here that, that also have a little bit of a better fossil record, but these are just to give you an idea of the size range among them. Um, so when we think about Hesperornis, this is what we're thinking about, Hesperornis regulus, but just keep in mind that it, the genus Hesperornis actually represents a lot of diversity. So in terms of ongoing research, things that I'm still working on, sorting out that diversity and trying to come up with a taxonomic scheme that accurately reflects the diversity without over splitting or over lumping, which is difficult to do, is one of the things that I'm interested in right now. Um, so in particular, how many species of Hesperornis are there? And how many genera of Hesperonithidae are there, or Hesperonithids? Um, so if we come back here, that brings us to sort of this area of the chart. Are these valid species? Are these all actually distinct enough that they should be considered separate species? Could some of these be lumped together? Um, and then also, how about these other poorly known uh, genera? So Asia Hesperornis, Canadaga, and Chupchiornis. Chupchiornis is the newest form that we know of. It was described last year um, from a very fragmentary specimen discovered in Japan, um, which greatly extended the geographic range. Um, the furthest east we've gotten before that was over in Russia, uh, Mongolia. So um, some interesting, but again, very fragmentary, so hard to say much about. Some of the problems that plague taxonomy of Hesperniforms in particular in the past um, have been rushed descriptive work, uh, so incorrect observations based on specimens that weren't fully prepared, perhaps. Um, so for instance, um, this element, this is the Tarsometatarsis of Hesperniforms regulus, um, these two holes, you can see them quite clearly here, they were described as being absent um, initially further preparation of the specimen identified that no, they're actually there, they were just covered up with dirt. Um, so looking at details like that um, is one good way to sort of sort through these species that have been erected for various reasons. Um, imprecise language is another thing that I run into a lot. When people publish a new species, they have to say why. They think it was you know, a unique, distinct species. And a lot of times the language that people use tends to be uh, not as scientific as we would hope. So. All of these different Hesperoniforms, so this is a broad avid, this is Parahesperonis, these are all different species of Hesperonis, um, all of these have been described as being unique because they are more slender than Hesperonis regulus. Well, that's great, uh, but that doesn't really tell us much about how they relate to each other or, or it doesn't really give us anything concrete to work with. But slender is actually quantifiable, right? You could take length versus width and get, you could measure how slender something is. And when we do that for Hesperoniforms, this is looking at Pasquiornis all the way down through Hesperoniforms and Parahesperoniforms, what we see is that they all follow the same trend. We can't really say that any of these are, are more or less slender than the others. Um, some of them are just bigger than the others. So to, to be more precise about language, um, while there may be valid size differences to group some of these um, into distinct species or, or genera, fine, but you're not actually looking at splendor. So one of the things that I'm playing around with uh, is to use multivariate statistics um, as a means of identifying these morphological traits. So rather than saying splendor, actually making the measurements and seeing what comes out of that. Um, I don't want to get too much into the, the 
technicalities of the statistics, but basically I'm, I'm collecting as many measurements as I can um, from the main bones that are preserved for these birds. It wouldn't make any sense to focus on other bird bones just because we don't really have them. Um, and here's the number of specimens that, that we've been able to include so far just of Hesperniform. Um, and I'm using a principal components analysis to visualize these data. Um, again, without getting too into it, um, it's easy to visualize two measurements. Right, you just graph them against each other, and here you can look at how they relate to each other. It's a very easy thing to do. You could use a ternary diagram if you wanted to graph three measurements, so let's say the length of each of these elements, uh, and you could see how the data plot out there. But what happens when you have 40 measurements? You know, that's, that's, that's a lot of different pairwise graphs. That's obviously not a reasonable way, and PCA is how we do that. So it's really just a way of minimizing the number of variables we have to look at. And so here are the results of the analysis of just the femur measurement. So here's uh, as far as regular femur with all of the different measurements graphed onto it. So um, lots of measurements. Um, and then here are the light gray would be greaves, the dark gray would be modern loons, just as a basis of comparison. And then the different Hesperniforms color coded here, the stars with the holotype specimens. Um, and so we can see that they're, they're doing very different things. Um, Bathornus is most like the modern birds. Um, and then these guys, Parasaurus and Asaurus, are, are far different, um, potentially much more derived divers. One of the interesting things that comes out of this is a way of visualizing how these different measurements are playing out, what each measurement is telling us. So what I want you to get out of this, don't stress too much about this figure, each number represents one of the measurements that I collected. One of the things you can tell is that all of the measurements going this direction are doing the opposite to the measurements that are going this direction. So if this is width of the femur, for example, and this is length of the femur, that would tell us that the shape of the femur is changing across these birds. Um, some of these specific measurements that I've identified as being significant in terms of how they vary among the forms are the length of this menial expansion, the angle of the top of the tarsometatarsus here, the angle of the second trochlea there. So that's what I'm looking for right now, is trying to, to figure out where is the variation among these birds that matters. We're not really interested in size necessarily, but what sorts of, what sorts of actual data can we collect um, to answer this question? Um, another one that, that seems to be significant is that this is the top of the tibia tarsus, so looking end on down at it. So this is where the femur articulates. And this, this sort of flattened facet right here uh, varies quite a bit as well. And so all of, all of these things start to get more at this question of, of how foot-propelled diving evolves. How do birds lose the ability of, to fly in order to maximize their success in a marine environment? And again, what we're talking about is convergence. So we're talking about how all of these very distantly related modern birds, so these guys, the modern foot-propelled divers, are not particularly closely related to each other. They all evolved foot-propelled diving separately, and yet they all came to the same sorts of morphologies in general. Um, and so can we look at different diving strategies among them to see where Hesperniviforms pan out? Um, how do they compare in these details to these different groups of modern diving birds? Um, and so it's the same sort of analysis that I was looking at before, just scaled back in terms of the number of variables, so really just looking at length of the hind limb bones. Um, so here are the measurements for the fossil specimens and then the modern specimens too. So now I have a much larger data set. And any time you start looking at numbers, the bigger the data set you can get, the better. And here are some of those measurements that I was uh, collecting for all of these birds just to give you an idea of sort of what we're, what we're dealing with. And what we see are that um, cormorants and diving ducks uh, are doing their own thing. Greaves, very independent, and then loons as well, also doing their own thing quite differently. And the Hesperniviforms fall out almost entirely over here. Um, so these data were something that um, uh, Louise and I published a year and a half or so ago now. Um, which is very interesting because when people talk about Hesperniviforms, they used to only talk about loons and greaves um, as corollaries, as good analogs for them. But what we can see in these data, in terms of their morphology, diving ducks and cormorants are actually much more appropriate sorts of analogs. We can also use this to identify some of the ways that the skeleton changes among diving birds 
And some of the things that we see are important are eight, which is this nemial expansion, and then we see that the uh, tibia tarsus and tarsum metatarsus um, are essentially doing the same thing. Um, and so what that looks like, tibia tarsus versus tarsum metatarsus length, all these birds are doing it exactly the same. So that tells us that there's a very strong evolutionary pressure uh, to maintain this ratio, um, even though they all evolved to this lifestyle in very different ways. Alternatively, the story is totally different if we look at the nemial expansion. So this is looking at the length of that expansion versus the length of the bone of the tibia tarsus. And what we see are that um, the loons are doing their own thing. They're incredibly different. Uh, and then we've got these, this trend here, which would be uh, the greaves, and this trend here, which would be the cormorants and the diving ducks. And we've got the heads for the kind of doing their own thing out there. And if we look at a picture of that, we see what that looks like. So this graph here is basically explaining these differences in this nemial expansion. Obviously, this is the loon doing its crazy thing all by itself. Um, cormorants and diving ducks, very similar, much less expanded. Um, Greaves here, and then the Hesperna the form. Um, the bones up here are the patella, uh, which tell an interesting story, but unfortunately, I wasn't able to include them in the data set because they're not preserved very often, and loons don't have patella. Um, but patella is involved in the same muscle attachments that are used in the menial expansion here. Um, so it just, it's a really interesting way of breaking down the physical details involved in a big transition. So an evolutionary switch from flying or terrestrial lifestyle of birds to a specific aquatic, fully aquatic lifestyle. Um, and so these are the sorts of things that I'm interested in, um, as well as better understanding this highly diverse um, and yet poorly understood group of fossil birds. So, thank you guys for your time. Um, Defining what you mean by better is a difficult thing to answer. Um, there are different ways you could, you could measure speed, you could measure uh, distance, you could measure lots of things. But the interesting thing about this is the medial expansion is huge, but you have to remember they've lost their patella. So in terms of total muscle attachment, they're not actually that much different from these cormorants who have a smaller medial expansion but a very robust patella. So the same muscles are attaching to both of these places, whereas they're just attaching here. So it's really just, a, just a, a, a way that we can identify that these guys both arrived at foot-propelled diving down different evolutionary pathways. Yeah, Bo? Uh, were you able to take any histology samples to see sort of the density? Yeah, um, there are a couple of specimens that have been uh, sectioned and looked at histology in terms of age, um, which is important if you're looking at size as a definition. You have to be able to rule out the fact that they're young individuals. Um, but I have not had luck with museums letting me chop up their fossils. <laughs> <laughs> it's a struggle. It's just, I haven't given up yet. We'll figure it out. <laughs> yeah. You know, like, considering that the upper this may be inaccurate, but it could be, like, drawing for something more closer, like, you look at the, it could be, it could be a way that, that when it dies, they, they can launch themselves into the water? Mm hmm Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So, so pretty much this is a warm water bird. It wouldn't be like a penguin in cold water. It's mainly just probably a warm ocean or a warm water bird. Well, we find them all the way up to the Arctic, um, but we have to remember the Mesozoic was a much warmer time period um, than what we're in today. Uh, but they don't seem to be restricted in terms of latitude at all in the Northern Hemisphere. You want to tell how fast they could swim? Would it be compared to modern birds, anything like that? Um, you, you could do estimates comparing them to the range of speeds that we see in the modern birds, but I'm not sure how accurate it would be, given that Hesperornis, so um, the one that has the sort of most advanced diving capabilities, was also probably three times the size mm -hmm. of the modern divers. So how that body mass would play into the speed is something that you would have to model. Any terrestrial ancestors that led up to Hesperornis have been found? Or any guesses you know, that's about interesting. That? We, the Pasquiornis is the only one that exhibits some of those primitive traits 
um, like a better developed wing. We don't really have very many of the pre-aquatic ancestors preserved yet that we recognize. But yeah, that would be great to find. <laughs> They went extinct at the end of the Cretaceous with the rest of the non-avian dinosaurs, sadly. Yeah. Um, so, I have a question regarding ecology. Mm -hmm. So, these are, of course, diving birds um, that are I'm trying to organize my thoughts. Um, there, you said that your research—I read your research. Um, groups them most closely with like diving ducks and cormorants mm -hmm. in terms of the overall foot anatomy. Is there any sort of differences in terms of the lifestyle of diving ducks and cormorants that directly separates them from like loons and greaves in terms of what they're doing that could tell us maybe more about what these animals are like in life? Yeah, there absolutely are. Okay. Um, so in terms of their habitat, in terms of the environments that they sort of favor, uh, diving ducks are very different from cormorants. Yes. Um, cormorants are the, uh, the only um, of the of the modern divers, they're the mm -hmm. ones that are primarily known for being marine. Mm -hmm. um, there are examples of cormorants that are freshwater as well, mm -hmm. uh, but they're unique in that they span both of those bridges. Um, diving ducks tend to, even where they're found on in coastal areas, they don't go out to sea the way that cormorants do. Um, and so in that regard, I feel like cormorants are probably a better analog for Hesperidiformes than diving ducks. But in terms of the data from the morphology measurements, you can't really distinguish between the two. Okay. And do you think that would like, if you were to like say, point at a species and say that that's a good uh, idea of what a uh, Hesperornithine was like or what it was doing, so it, you'd be probably be cormorants then. Yeah, there is actually one flightless cormorant. Yes, um, cormorant. Yeah, and so I, I feel like that would probably be a, a pretty good one, but its wing is not as reduced uh -huh. as a Hesperornithine wing. So in terms of it being an exact analog, it's not. Um, but it would be a pretty good one to point out. So, is there any evidence of these of animals that preyed on these birds? Were any ichthyosaurs or marine reptiles eating them, or anything? Yeah, like there's one specimen in South Dakota that uh, <coughs> was found as gut contents in a mosasaur. Mm -hmm. um, so, mosasaur snacked on them. I mean, compared to compared to marine reptiles, they're not that big, so they would have been a tasty treat for lots of things out there for sure. I'm oh, sorry, question. Yeah. But they have, I've seen when they had a Dr. Habib was here, they had a model of a flying like pterosaur. Mm -hmm. Any thoughts of maybe making a model size cormorant and a mechanical and see if it could propel there's, itself? There's been a lot of work that's been done on that um, out of some biomechanics labs that work specifically on the modern divers. So they've measured uh, force production, lift, and drag in the foot motion while they swim. Um, and they've done that through um, sort of video measurements of swimming birds but also through model development of like artificial like models of these guys. So yeah, there's been some work done on that. Yeah. Um, what features make the grebe not able to walk on land? So it has to do with the way the femur sticks into the pelvis, so the thigh bone into the pelvis. Um, if you think about sort of a rough human analog would be not everybody can do the splits. Right? So if you think about all of the muscle attachments that are involved in controlling how your legs open and close, in greaves in particular, the, the femur is entirely within the body cavity. So it doesn't stick out of the body at all as part of the leg. Um, and it's rotated backwards. So they can't bring their legs fully underneath them the way that a duck would if a duck were standing up. Hmm. Yeah, they look kind of like seals when they kind of, like they can get up a little bit, but they're really awkward. <laughs> Yeah. Are there any theories as to why they went extinct? They got caught up in it like everybody else yeah. did. Um, we tend to see bigger things going extinct yeah. at the end of the Cretaceous, um, but has some forms range in size. Um, you know, the, the, the smaller ones went extinct too. Um, my guess would be that they were specialized to a marine environment and with the changes in water chemistry or whatever, they just could not couldn't make it through. Is there any inclination to what they said on the proximity of Yeah, we don't have any evidence for that. Based on the shape of the beak, um, does that really make sense? Yeah. Um, their, their teeth are, actually their teeth are kind of shaped like mosasaur teeth, but the, the point oh, was so they that they're really, really tiny. Okay. Yeah. Um, so they probably weren't like shell crunchers, yeah. but we don't have any direct evidence. Also, not a lot of them have skulls by the sound of 
Yeah, there's only maybe four specimens that preserve jaws, so. Yeah. You know what could be like, they may not only live in Greenland, but also in freshwater as well? Yeah, so Judy Nornis, the one from Mongolia, is the only one that's known from freshwater deposits. Mm -hmm. um, so that, that is the potential freshwater expert in the form, absolutely. And some of the others are known from estuary environments, so they, they were not restricted to the marine world. Yep? Yeah. Would you say like there are like um, any more like modern creatures today that are a lot similar to these species? Just the, just the modern divers that we talked about. Yeah. So cormorants, greaves, things like that. I have a question. Yeah. So you took a lot of measurements in specific bones and data was derived. A lot of data was derived from that. Mm -hmm. um, did you see any taxonomic like, distortion? Or oh, absolutely. There's tons of that. You have to, yeah. yeah. So there are probably half the specimens that I've looked at and tried to measure were too distorted to be measured. Um, so it's not a, they're, they're not flattened in general the way that some mesozoic birds are, but there is still taphonomy to take into account, absolutely. Okay. So if they did get squished, would you just Then that would that? be, then I would not include that. Do you know if they nested in great groups like some modern birds? No, we don't have any evidence that they're nesting at all, unfortunately. Yeah. What does the muscle connection that controls the feet tell you about how they move their feet? What were they doing with these different... Right, components? so um, you can narrow down uh, the muscle attachments by based on specifically which muscles control which toe and things like that. And so what we find are that the muscles that run along this ridge, or here on the patella in the case of the uh control the rotation of the toes. So that tells us that they were stacking their toes when they brought them back, and also the size indicates the power ability of pushing through water um, and how much power that requires. Are these all Cretaceous? Yes. Yeah. Or is there a range of states? No, they're all late Cretaceous. So why is it why does this favor of yours with animals? Because they're cool. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean seriously, I, I just think they're a great example of evolution in action and how in not a very long geologic amount of time we can see things go from Archaeopteryx to this, uh, which is a pretty crazy transition if you think about it. Thanks, guys. I appreciate it. Yeah. Can you come up and say, say a few words? Would you like to? Oh, oh. Well, I've got to apologize sure. and say thanks, and I'm oh, sorry. Okay. My yeah. short-term memory is not one of my best qualities, so. No, I, okay, well, I, I just, uh, um, brief introduction. My name is Luis Chiape, and I am the director of the Dinosaur Institute here, and a vertebrate paleontologist, and, uh, but I was hoping that uh, you guys like the new home for the Southern California Paleontological Society. Yes. Yeah. 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 To have you guys here, and uh, in to the extent possible to support this great group of people. So I know that a number of our paleontologists, uh, including myself. Uh, have come here to give you lectures, and that's that's great, and we want to continue doing that. And um, you know, this is your museum, so uh, feel very comfortable with it. Okay, thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.